Today from this subject, things that accompany salvation. Things that accompany salvation. Bless us, Lord. May we do no damage, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and holiness in Jesus' name. Amen. Things connected with salvation. Things that are near salvation and accompany it. Things that accompany salvation. Simply put, there are behaviors, goals, objections. There are lifestyles. There are things that are a part of being saved. When you get saved, there are certain things that accompany the new birth, the new life in Christ. As believers, there are certain things that we do, and there are certain things that we don't do. Things that accompany salvation. When somebody tells you that they are saved. There are, there are certain reasonable expectations. There are certain things that you look for, that you expect, that you, have, that you can reasonably uh, assume about a person if they tell you that they are saved. Amen. The Apostle Paul uh, said it this way uh, to the saints at uh, Ephesus, to the Ephesian saints. He says in Ephesians 4 and 22 through 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now if you look at it contextually. In chapter 4 verse 17 it says. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. That when we get saved, we do not walk as other Gentiles walk. You realize that the lost are in darkness. Their understanding is darkened because they're alienated from the life of God. Praise the Lord. Through ignorance, the ignorance that is in them. See, as Christians, you can't, we can't get our marching orders from the unsaved lost. They can't explain to us, uh, they can't give us Moral standards. The hip hoppers can't tell the church folk how to live. One church in Georgia, the preacher's deceased now, uh, was famous or uh, became infamous because he had a lot of worldly singers and rappers and R&B uh, people who didn't know Jesus featured at his church as though their fame in the entertainment world somehow gives them some kind of uh, license 
to tell the church and the saints what we should do, how we should live. I turn a complete deaf ear to any moral instructions from any movie star, any unsaved famous person. Doesn't matter to me how well they may do in business. The CEO of Apple can't teach me morals. You don't hear me. Amen. A uh, unsaved politician who endorses abortion can't come up in here and speak to you in this holy place and say, I support a woman's right to choose. His, their sentence won't get out their mouth before I have to ask them to sit down. Saturday was the national day of mourning. The national day of mourning. You know what we were mourning? Since 1973, 20 million African American babies have been aborted. To give you an idea, uh, I don't think the state of North Carolina, what is it, 10 million? What's the population of our state? It's not 20 million persons, mm -mm, not in this state. That many black folk who should be here are missing. I saw where, a, and I didn't know the churches could do it, there's a, a Baptist, a black church in, uh, African American church in Georgia that has a sign out in front of the church that says if you are black and you vote for Trump, you are mentally ill. And if you're white and you vote for Trump, you are a racist. That's on the other side of the sign. My position is vote your convictions, vote for who you want. But a sign like that doesn't make the argument. I could say, and I could make the argument, if you're black and you vote for somebody who supports abortion, the thing that have wiped out 20 million of us since 1973, you're mentally ill. Anything that's killing your people, will somebody please give me the logic, show me how that is good for us. What is logical about 46% of African Americans who should be living, who should be alive. We are, we are not here. Planned Parenthood kills more African American babies, more African Americans every two weeks than the Klan killed in its entire history. So if, you, so if you want to talk mental illness, you want to, if you want to talk about, and let's flip it, let's flip it. Let's talk about racism. 78% of Planned Parenthood's abortuaries are built within two miles of high black population centers. We're targeted. Planned Parenthood nurses have gotten saved my, I'm a little too flat, uh, brother. Have gotten saved and come out of it. And one nurse testified. She said, I heard of myself. She said, when I was in that field, when the little black girl would come in pregnant for counseling, the first thing we would recommend was abortion. So when it was a white girl, we'd recommend abortion last. We would tell her of all of her options adoption and other things that you can do but when the little black girl comes in go straight to abortion is that not racism is that not racism at its worst see because you got to be born before you can be discriminated against see I want to make the argument you got to be here 
before you can complain about uh, not having equal access, before we can complain about income inequality. <laughs> you, got to be, you, got to, you got to be grown so you can grow up and get a job before you ever get to these other things. It's why as believers, we can't let the world give us our mark. If I could talk with Oprah Winfrey, and congratulations to her on her own network, own, and she's come a long way. But I, I want to know why. Why do you, you know who your core audience is. White folk are not watching own. Amen. Not, in, not like we do. Why you push? So hard, homosexuality. Why, why, why are you, you why is the girl got to kiss the girl and the guy got to be with the guy? I mean, when it, it don't even make the movie. The movie was fine without it. Why does these things have to be interjected? Why? And, and it's on all television. Don't, don't get me wrong, she's not the only one. ABC, NBC, CBS. The point I'm making is that their minds, the world's minds, are darkened. They're darkened because they're alienated from Christ. So they can't teach us through movies, through songs, through books, through seminars, in the business community, wherever, they can't teach us morals. They can't tell us who God is. See, they don't know. You, you, uh, 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 an athlete on television can't instruct me on who God is. You don't hear me today. Bible says because they are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness. That means uh, no restraints, no restraints, sexual lasciviousness, no restraints, no guidelines, no rules. You hear it all the time. Anytime you hear a politician, a, a, an entertainer, an athlete, or whomever say publicly to you, people should be able to love who they want to love. Do what they want to do. It's nobody's business. That's lasciviousness. No restraints. There are restraints. There are guidelines. Where do you think we got all these sexually transmitted diseases from? They came from man not operating in the restraints that God put in place. Somebody even sung about the thing. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you with. That's somebody sitting across the, uh, across the, uh, the, 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 the way from you. Just, just get with them. Just get with anybody. The world tells us to do anything with anyone at any time. No restraints. And yet God said, save that behavior for marriage. And that is to be between a man and a woman. And yet the world constantly sends us messages of no restraints. Praise the Lord. Person, I wanted to ask uh, President Obama when, uh, 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 and thank you, I have here, the, um, this is of 2018, the population for the state of North Carolina, 10.3 million. So that means since, since uh, 1973, we have, in the black community alone, aborted the state of North Carolina two times. Charlotte, Jacksonville, Greenville, Wilmington, Raleigh, Cary, everywhere you go, go to the malls, everywhere you go. See, all these people, 
All of these people gone. Never got a chance to see the light of day. And if there's someone here who has had an abortion, and there is, someone who's watching, and you've had an abortion, and there is, because one in four black women have had one, according to the statistics. If you've repented of your sins, God has forgiven you. Don't, don't leave. Don't feel the, the need to get up and leave the service. And I know these things are hard to hear. But I'll tell you what's harder. If preachers say nothing. If we say nothing, the slaughter will continue. And in certain states, soon I'll be going to New York. I'm going to the belly of the beast. The, I'm going to New York City. 64,000 abortions. New York City. They have that many in a year. 35 plus abortion clinics. That's the belly of the beast. New York City. Love life is... Uh, I'm going up there to work with Justin and the brethren. And I'm telling you right now, the Lord willing, we're going in October. And I'm uh, going up on a Friday and uh, uh, on a Saturday. And we're, we're, we're looking for a church for me to preach at that Sunday. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to try and turn hearts and turn minds. We're going, we're going to the belly of the beast. They tell us no restraints. I cringed because they, they never explained it. When the then president of the United States, President Barack Obama, and his lovely wife, First Lady Michelle, both said on multiple occasions, people should be able to love who they want to love. And every time they would say that, I would ask, oh really, how far does that go? Since you... Gave no qualifiers. Guess who else agrees with you, Mr. President and First Lady? The pedophile. Guess who else agrees with you? The incest people. There has to be. I'm preaching already. I come out the block preaching. There has to be restraints. Oh, what fallen man is capable of. You don't want to send the message that there are no restraints. You don't want to do that. We don't want to live in a society where there are no restraints. For when there are no, no restraints, no one is safe. Babies get molested. Fathers rape their daughters. Mothers their sons. Men get with men and women with women and uh, uh, adultery breaks out everywhere. Fornication breaks out everywhere. And all of the hurt, the pain, the disease, the heartache, and the heartbreaks, and all of the things that accompany that behavior. The brokenheartedness. The women who've been disappointed. He said he loved me. And then he loved and left her. Now she's struggling. Praise the Lord. Don't have to trust men anymore because of a heartbreak. No restraint. I could, you know what? I could park right here for the rest of the day and deal with the price that we are paying as a nation that have said, no restraints. Everything goes. Do what you want. Follow your heart. Worst advice ever given. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. One of, the, one of the most repeated mantras in music, in society. Trust your heart. Follow your heart. Your heart will tell you. Your heart, your heart, your heart. And yet the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. The last thing you want to trust is your heart. Well, what should I trust, preacher? The written word of God. The Bible will never leave you, lead you astray. And you can trust preaching as long as the preaching lines up with the word. But if the preacher don't line up with the scripture, don't trust him either. 
That's why when you come here, I said, bring your Bible. I'm a Bible preacher. You know, you notice that, right? I read the scripture and let the scriptures speak for themselves. And all you got to do is just go back home and look up uh, lasciviousness, if you don't believe me. Working uh, uh, unto all, unto lasciviousness. Let me move on. To work all uncleanness and greededness. Here's my point. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. That is, you didn't learn this way through becoming a Christian. This is not what Christ taught you. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning the former conversation. Amen. Putting off concerning the former conversation are things that accompany salvation. The point of our text, the goal of our text, hear me today, saints, those who are, who are streaming, you have Facebook Live saints, the saints of God. The goal of the text is that of maturity. Remember, verse 6 starts with, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Let us grow to maturity. The Christian must grow. The Christian must grow. In fact, the writer rebukes the saints for their lack of growth. Chapter 5, verse 11 through 14 says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Dull of hearing literally means you are too lazy to understand. It's amazing the emphasis that the Bible places on the listener. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, the preacher must say it, but you got to get it. This is why in church you don't want to be in church on your cell phone. You don't want to be in church texting people and carrying on conversations because something may be said of God that will save your life. But you got to get it. You got to, you got to get it. And so many people today are too lazy to hear what is actually being said. Sometimes, do you know people hear what they want to hear? And they interpret what they want to interpret versus hearing what you actually said. Jesus says, he that have ears to hear. Hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, Jesus could see. He could actually look out and see that people had ears. What he was talking about was spiritual ears. Ears to hear spiritual things. He says, I got many things that I want to teach you. There are things that I want to tell you. He says, but you are, you are dull of hearing for when by the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is, look at this, this is strong language, unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe but the strong meat strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age that mature believer mature believer even those by reason of use that is through experience have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In order, saints, to make progress, please bear with me for a few minutes. In order to make progress, we must leave the childhood things, leave childhood things behind, 
and move forward into spiritual growth. The truth is we learn the ABCs that we might be able to read words. And we learn words so that we can read sentences and books. You don't learn the ABCs to stop at ABC. The point is to be able to learn how to read words. Words lead to sentences. Sentences lead to books. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, he said, I put away childish, childish things. Yes, we build on the basics that we might grow and move to the next level. There are things that God wants to show us. Do you not know that the last thing the Apostle Peter said to us in writing, the last thing that he said to the entire body of Christ, was he told us, whatever you do, Peter said, grow. For a second Peter a chapter 3, verse 17 and 18 says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He says, don't let the world, don't let sinners, don't let the error of false teaching, don't let the drug world, don't let the world pull you from your steadfastness in Christ. How is it that saved believers uh, uh, don't get pulled away so easily from their steadfastness in Jesus Christ? He said, instead of being pulled away, he says, but grow in grace. Grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The key to being pulled away is uh, to, to keep from being pulled away from your steadfastness is not that you stand still, but you continue to grow. You continue to seek the Lord. You continue to allow the Lord to speak to you. These were his last words. Grow in grace. Are you with me today? Oh my, God's going to bless somebody today. Paul said this. He says, every man that striveth for the master is, is temperate in all things. Everybody who strives, he strives to be mature. You want to be the best. You don't want to be no further in God today than you were 10 years ago. You don't want to be a believer who can quote no more scripture today than you could five years ago. You don't want to be a saved man, a father, the head of a household, and you're still slowful. You were slow 10 years ago, and you're slow now. You would barely come to church 10 years ago, and you barely comes now. You would barely do, your, your children have never heard you pray. They've never seen you read the Bible, and, and, and they don't now. There come a time. There come a time that a man has to grow. In fact, you know, I get in trouble with my own because what we tend to celebrate uh, in our country and in our community, we, we celebrate eternal adolescence. We seem to like the, the man who never grows up. The guy who at 40 still trying to act like a teenager. The guy who at 60 is still trying to behave as though he's in his 20s and still making stupid, dumb, silly, youthful errors. Let me tell you something. That may be entertaining, but you don't want to be married to anybody like that. Praise the Lord. He may be able to sing a song and you may be able to do the percolator to his music, but you don't want to marry him because you're married to a fool. And you'll never be anything. You'll never get anywhere because he won't grow up. Uh, I thank God that, that the Lord gave me a wife. We grew together. 
We couldn't have done the things that we've done and accomplished what we've accomplished if we would have uh, fought maturity. You don't hear my preaching today. Some preacher, some believers struggle because they fail to mature. Maturity leads to failure. As we can, as we see already that immaturity, a refusal to grow, a failure to launch is something that does not accompany salvation. Oh my, let me preach a little harder here. The point of Ephesians chapter 5, the point of, excuse me, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 is this. The writer was saying, you have been professed Christians long enough to be teachers. But because of your laziness and dullness in grasping the truth, you, you must be taught a second time. The first simple doctrines of Christ. You have not grown at all. It's a tough letter. It's a tough letter. You, you are still babes and unwaned. That is, you're still on the titty. Grown. Your mama is still giving. She's still nursing you. A grown man. Preach wouldn't milk feeding. Milk feeding was a metaphor used by many writers, both sacred and profane, to express the first principles of religion, the first principles of science, the first principle of any discipline when you are on the early stages. The first principles of what they teach you is called milk. Milk. So everybody say milk. milk. Amen. They applied sucking. Uh, a baby sucking milk from his mother. Sucking was a term applied to learning. And uh, an infant to every beginner. See, if you are called a babe, you're called a rookie. You're a beginner. And meat was for those who had learned the first principles of the truth. So, so you don't want to be years later still a suckling. Years later, you still got to be encouraged to attend church on Sunday. Years later, we still can't find you through the week. Years later, it's still a struggle for you every Sunday. You argue with yourself on whether or not you should pay your tithe. Still obey. All oh, these years later, here you are, and now you're confused about sexuality. Well, Pastor, you know, I, 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 hear, I hear that stuff you be saying. Don't call what I preach stuff. So say, say what it is. I hear the Bible that you've been preaching. It ain't stuff. It's the Word of God. And you mean to tell me, you mean to tell me that the world can begin to change your mind can turn you from the scriptures. These things ought not to be. Can I get a witness? The characteristics of a babe is that they're dull of hearing. Chapter 5, verse 11. Unskillful in the word. Hebrews 5 and verse 13. But the characteristics of an adult believer is number one, he's capable of instruction. It is true that you find Paul going from city to city, instructing in the synagogue. But he wasn't instructing the ones who believe. He was instructing the unbeliever. The believer is supposed to have a spirit of learning. And why they don't need endless instruction. Praise the Lord. The lost needs that. But the believer, when God saves you, if you lack the Lord, the Lord will open your understanding. Praise the Lord. And, and you, you'll be able to get it from reading the Bible and studying the scriptures and hearing the preached word of God. One of the things, uh, chapter 5, Hebrews verse 14, teaches that when you are mature, you develop the spirit of uh, discernment, discrimination. You learn how to discriminate. 
to decide between good and evil. That's what the word discriminate means. It's to decide. You need to know the difference between right and wrong because we're living in a world today where the world is calling wrong right and right wrong and then the world now will try to shame you and put you on front street for standing with traditional biblical truth the bible is right and the devil is a liar let me let me move on here in chapter 6 verse 1 through 2 speaks of growing he says therefore leaving not abandoning but building on Leaving, building on the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, it says we're going to leave the ABCs and we're going to go on to spiritual maturity. Somebody shout, let's grow. Now, notice what he calls the ABCs of the doctrine of Christ. And you'll see how, uh, how their classes must have been much tougher than ours. Praise the Lord, because uh, what uh, we call the ABCs today, they didn't call the ABCs. They call the ABCs of the doctrine of Christ. Here's the thing he listed. Number one, he says repentance. Look at this, not laying again the, the foundation of, number one, repentance from dead works, where you don't have to keep repenting from the same thing. Over and over and over because you grow. Move on from repentance, from dead works, and from, from faith, in, uh, and faith in God through Christ Jesus. Notice we're going from repentance, to, from dead works, and from faith toward God through Christ. That is, it ought to be settled in you that you know who God is through Jesus Christ. That you know the, per the person of Christ. And that, the, that, that Jesus Christ came to give us the gift of eternal life. Praise the Lord. So that, that ought to be settled. Baptisms, whether it's water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit, baptisms into Christ, that ought to be a settled doctrine. We're moving. Notice he called these things the ABCs. We call these things seminaries, uh, teachings. He says, and moving on from the laying on of hands. That is, we ought, we ought to be settled. Where you understand the ministry of the laying on of hands. We bless men by laying hands on them. We make offerings by the laying on of hands. We ordain people by laying on of hands. We impart the Holy Ghost in people by laying on the hand. We heal the sick and bless children. We perform miracles and impart spiritual gifts by the laying on of hands. And then he said we're moving from the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Yes, we're going to get up. Yes, Christ got up. And the day will come that all who die in Jesus will be resurrected from the dead. Glory to God. There is coming a resurrection. And then the doctrine of eternal judgment. I want to tell you, Carlton Pearson, you got it wrong. And everybody who's fallen into that universal thing, you got it wrong. There is an eternal judgment. Every man must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible teaches that every individual will give an account of the deeds done in their bodies. And anybody who try to tell you different, they're, they're misleading you. They're leading you astray. There is an eternal judgment. There is a heaven. And there is a hell. Isn't it amazing? The number of unsaved people who believe in the existence of heaven. But they believe you make your heaven or hell here on this earth. They don't believe in a literal hell. But they believe there's a literal, a literal heaven. I'm here to tell you the same one who, who taught us about heaven. Teach about hell. In fact, Jesus spoke of hell more than he did heaven. And we're to, he warned us. So whatever you do, dodge that place. He said you'd be better off going to heaven with one eye, with one hand and one, one foot than to go to hell with both eyes, both hands and both feet. You don't want to go to that place. And the thing about getting down there is when you get there, you'll never get out. 
The Bible teaches that it is a place where the fire is not quenched, where the maggots, the worms, dieth not. And it, it is, the Bible calls it outer darkness. And Jesus died so we wouldn't have to go to that place. Yes, sir. So he says, these are elementary things. And he says, and this we will do if God permits. In other words, we will move on. He says, I'm determined that we grow. I'm determined that we move forward. But I want to acknowledge that we need God's help. It cannot be done without divine aid. It takes the Lord to grow us. That's why you got to keep praying and keep fasting and keep reading your Bible. Keep coming to church. So you may, may want to be strong, but you can't be strong on your own. It takes the Lord. Lord, help me to be strong. God, strengthen me where I'm weak. I often pray and I ask God to build me up where I'm torn down. For I have weaknesses that I can't address. I have gaps that I can't fill. I have things wrong with me that I cannot straighten out. But oh, God, if you touch me, you're able to help me. You're able to help my mind. You're able to help my heart. You're able to help me in my thinking. You're able to help me with my desires, cravings, and lust. Lord, you're able. And I heard the writer notice what he said. He said, this you all will do. He didn't say this you will do if God permits. He said, this we will do if God permits. That means he included himself. My God, you ought to say the word is including me also. I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in it. Let me move on here, Rocky. Now let's give the writer to make his point gives a, a hypothetical. He gives a powerful hypothetical case that shows the necessity of maturity. That shows the necessity of growth. Uh, it shows why being lazy of understanding and dull of hearing is so dangerous. Because what he does is he gives uh, a hypothetical not of a lazy Christian, but he gives a hypothetical of a mature Christian. Uh-huh, he says... For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and uh, have tasted uh, the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Mm, said, if after all that, look at this thing here. He says, they fall away. It doesn't seem, notice, see, he, he's not giving an example of a baby. Because <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't describe a babe in Christ as one who's been enlightened. And one who have tasted of the heavenly gift. And then been partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted of the good word of God. And the powers of of the world to come. He's dealing here with anything but an immature believer. And yet he says that if that person would fall away. Good God almighty. He says and if they fall after having received all that. If they fall away to renew them again unto repentance. That is if they leave Christianity. I want to talk to the workers now. Don't take your salvation for granted. Don't assume that you're so saved that the devil can't trick you. Don't assume that you're so far gone in Christ that nothing can pull you down. Because the devil can fool all of us. Ain't nobody beyond the devil's ability to trick and the devil's ability to deceive. So now he looks and he says, I watch this. He says, praise the Lord, if they would fall away. That is, if they were with their conscience of mind. Good God Almighty, turn away from Jesus and throw themselves headlong into sin. If they fall away, he said it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance. 
let me set this passage in its context. I believe the man's name was Decius. Oh Lord, he was the first Roman emperor to persecute Christians systematically. He was the first one to begin to kill him and then require that all of the, the, them show evidence that they had sacrificed unto him. In other words, he said, you can live if you show the world that you have sacrificed unto me, that you have made me the emperor, your God, instead of that Christian God that you are serving. And some of the Christians, to save their own lives, they confess this emperor as God. Some of the other Christians uh, bribed their way out of it. Some of the other Christians got away through flight. But those who denounced Jesus and then began to serve this emperor, they left the law. And the, by the history teaches uh, that the emperor died. And after he died, a great debate broke out concerning lapse and apostate Christians who submitted to the emperor. See, once the emperor was dead and, and the fire was over and the persecutions were gone, they come trying to make their way back to the church. You know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all, you ain't gonna like me today. But you know, this sermon here is one that ain't Ain't designed to get many amens, but some of you, uh huh, when the leader of the free country with your color, whatever he did, you didn't have nothing to say about it. Oh, Lord, you said that morals didn't matter. You said you got to separate your religion from politics. And now that he's no longer in office, now here you come with your righteous indignation. Oh, now it's wrong to tell a lie. Uh, amen. Now it's wrong to do wrong. But it wasn't wrong for eight years. You had nothing to say because it was somebody that you liked. Well, when that emperor was in office, he said, you got to, you got to serve me. And many of the Christians, they decided to serve him. And when he died, they tried to make their way back to the church. Well, the church said, oh no, we, we got to have a talk about this. We got to talk about this. He said, because when the fire was hot, the rest of us stayed in the church. Many of us were killed. Many of us lost our jobs. Many of us was, uh, were persecuted in society. When you went and got on the other side, now that he's dead, now you want to come back and name the name of Christ. One of the things that the early church did not take lightly, they didn't take lightly people who would defect from the church to save their lives and then come back to the church when times were better. Oh no, you had to be willing to go through with us through the storm and rain. You remember Paul and Barnabas fell out because John Mark, he left the church when the fire got hot. Paul said, I can't use him because he wouldn't hang in there through the tough times. We're living in a day where people can backslide and go have their fans and do whatever they want to do. And then when the thing goes south, then they come back to the church and want to get the same positions back. But I want you to know in the early church, they didn't see it like that. See, you got to have it like the Bible said. Mm, you got to be willing to go through the storm and the rain. Do I have anybody in here who will say I'm going to serve Jesus when it's convenient and I'm going to serve him when it's not? I'm going to serve Jesus and stand for him when it's popular to stand for him and I'm going to stand for him when it is not. Some of us 
a fair weather Christians. We're fair weather Christians. We'll hang in there. We love you, Brother Wooden, when you're preaching stuff that everybody likes. But when you get in our business, when you preach that stuff that make them talk about you at the water cooler, I don't even tell them that I'm from that church. The devil is a liar. Good God Almighty. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my heavenly father and before the angels. That's what this was all about. He said, if they, after they've tasted Jesus, if they backslide, if they leave the Lord, it is impossible to restore them, to renew them again. Seeing, notice what the text says, that they have crucified to themselves the Lord Jesus. That is, on a psychological and spiritual level, they have determined within themselves that Jesus is not worth serving. That this man, being with this man, is more important than being with Jesus. They have decided within themselves they would rather have their lasciviousness than to be in the church. They've decided in their own minds that they would rather, you don't hear my preaching, rather go smoke dope, rather be a, be a whether they would rather be a drug head, they would rather go out there and live a sinful life than to serve the Lord and in themselves they have a conversation in their own mind and they determine within themselves that Jesus is not worth it. Notice what it says. They crucify to themselves the Son of God. They have a conversation. I'm intentionally parking right here because I don't want you to do that. You can't have a conversation in your own mind and just determine that your own personal happiness, your own personal fulfillment means more to you than suffering with Jesus. You can't determine, man, that your own personal fulfillment with that woman means more to you than your family. And there you go. You pack your bags and leave your wife and leave your children chasing after her. By the time you leave, you've already crucified your family in your mind. Y'all don't like my preaching. You've already come to the conclusion that little Johnny and little Susie, hallelujah, they're not worth, they're not worth you sacrificing that, that pleasure out there to raise your family. So therefore, long before you left the house, you crucified your family in your own mind. Many of us, long before it manifested, we've had conversations for six months. I don't know if Jesus is Lord. I don't know if I want to be saved. I don't know if I want to be real. I think I may want to be a five percenter. I think I want to be a, a black Hebrew. I think I want to join this. I think I want to pledge. I think I want to be a Mason. I think I'd rather be that than to be with Jesus. You're crucifying Jesus in your mind. You're having a conversation with yourself. And Jesus lost. Jesus got the short end of the conversation. And you decided that you would rather go do that. Go be that. Go be with them than to be with Jesus. And when it says crucify or fresh, what does a fresh mean? The word of fresh means over and over and over and over. Every day that you're out there, you did it again. Every day that you left your family, you did it on Monday. If you're with that woman on Tuesday, you did it again. If you're with her in, in 2018, 
and you're still doing it in 19 and you left your family you're doing it over and over and over afresh 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 why don't you praise him afresh A backslidden preacher left your family. Backslidden missionary, look at you. Decided that you're gonna go back and try to regain some years that you lost. Praise the Lord. In your 70s, trying to look 30, trying every day you're doing it. You're crucifying the Lord over and over again. You were in the holiness church. Now you're LBGTQ. You're crucifying Jesus over and over again. Every day that you're out there puffing that cigarette, they know you are a preacher. You're crucifying Jesus over and over again. And you're putting Jesus to an open shame. You got people looking at you saying if that's what the church is all about, I don't want to be saved. You're doing it to Jesus Christ, even though the Lord have been good to you, even though the Lord have been merciful. How do you know he's been good? The text tells us that the Lord has been good, for the text says, as the earth drinks the rain that comes often, upon it that is God sends the rain God I'm, I'm gonna preach this in a minute sends the rain the earth drinks in the rain oh, God intentionally redundant sends the rain the earth drinks the rain God sends the rain the earth drinks the rain. Now, ask your neighbor, what kind of ground are you? For the law sends the rain and the earth drinks the rain. But what kind of ground is you? God is good to all of us. The law is merciful. To all of us, the Lord woke every one of us up this morning. Every one of us can hear the sermon. You can hear the gospel. God is sending the rain. The earth drinks the rain. But Some of the ground brings forth herbs, brings forth food, brings forth good things that is meat for the preparers. Good stuff grow. Vegetables, crops, fruit, good things, which leads to blessings. But then there are other grounds. That with the same rain, same gospel, same rain, bring forth briars, thorns, thistles, and that leads to cursing. Now the question is, the question is not whether or not God's sending the rain. The question is not whether there's something wrong with the gospel. The question is, what kind of ground are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? with the rain that the Lord is sending you. Somebody ought to say, I'm gonna grow in grace. I'm gonna move from where I am. I'm gonna come up and get better for it's time to mature. It's time to get over this and get over that, to leap over this and step over that. I've been stuck too long. The Lord 
has been too good to me. The Lord has sent too much rain. It's time for me to grow. It's time for me to mature. Oh, oh Lord. Grab somebody by both hands and let's grow, let's grow, let's grow. Come on and help me preach. Come on and help me preach. Say, neighbor, I expect you to grow. Neighbor, use your preaching voice. I expect you to come up in the Lord. Why? Because these are the better things. These are the things that accompany salvation. When you get saved, you grow in grace. When you get saved, you climb higher and higher and higher. To have anybody who want to climb higher in the Lord. Let me hear you say, yeah. Yeah, Lord. Mm-hmm. Hey, now. I don't expect you to be on the same spiritual level in six months, uh, then you're on right now. I expect you to climb another round high. I expect you to say, preacher, I'm studying my Bible more than I used to. Mm-hmm. Preacher, I'm praying more than I used to pray. Oh, Lord. Preacher. I had a better understanding. I know there was a time when every six months you need to meet with me and have a counseling session. But look at me now. I've grown in grace. I can make it now. I can come and hear the word. Apply the word and be blessed of God. Because these are the things that accompany salvation. So he says, with the hypothetical, the believer growing, experiencing all this, and then walking away, he says, we expect better things of you. Chapter 5, those believers who are refusing to grow. We don't, we expect you to go from there because if immaturity will lead to failure and I have given you failure on the example of those who were further along than you, then what does that tell you about where you are? But then he warms and tells them, but we expect better, better things of you. Things that accompany salvation. And while you are striving for your better, striving to seek the Lord, striving to do right, striving to live right, striving to be a good Christian, oh, sometimes it's, let me tell you, it's hard growth and getting better. It's hard climbing that mountain. He says, just remember this, for God is not unrighteous. To forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Oh, you're working to keep from embarrassing his name. You'd rather do without than to name the name of Christ and and then be accused of being a thief. you'd You'd rather suffer for his name than to be called a Christian and you're caught cheating on the test. 
you, you'd, rather, you'd rather suffer. You'd rather just suffer. You'd just rather go through than to, than to take shortcuts that makes the faith look bad. He says, don't you worry. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He says, if you do this for me, I won't forget you. I won't forget you. Hallelujah. I won't forget you. And we desire that every one of you don't be lazy as in chapter 5 verse 11. He says, but we desire that every one of you show the same diligence of the full assurance of hope to the end. That you be not slow, but be followers of them. Pay attention to those believers who are doing it. Them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. They will tell you that through faith and perseverance, staying faithful to God and persevering, everything that God has given you, every promise the Lord has made, everything that God says will happen, will happen for you, will happen. But what we expect of you in the meantime is to be that kind of believer, to be the kind of man of God, the kind of woman of God, who do those things that accompany salvation. I, I wouldn't name the name of Christ. I wouldn't, I wouldn't name the name of Christ. And the things that are supposed to be associated with that name, none of those things are ever present in, in my life. How are you going to love the Lord and love the church and be a long-time lover of the church? I love my church. I believe what my church is doing. They check your tithing record and you hadn't tithed in 10 years. Record don't lie. How, 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 how are we going, how can it be, how, how can we claim these things? And then the things that are associated with that claim. See, that was the point. You, if you claim to be a missionary, you claim to be a preacher, then you can't publicly contradict that claim. All believers, the truth is, all believers die daily. So I'm not talking about perfection. All believers die daily. But what he's talking about is putting Christ to an open shame. And, and crucifying Jesus. Determining in your own mind that Jesus is not worth this. Uh-uh. He says, we're persuaded. We, we just believe that you won't do that. You can't from being a missionary. You can't from there. Some of us have from the church went to back to the club. You're going to go from the church to the bar. How you do that? It may, it may be manifested. It may have been manifested right away, but it didn't happen right away. The crucifixion had been going on for a long time. And then you finally go ahead on and, and, and just put Jesus out there. And then, and then get bad with your bad self. And, and the Christian, and nobody better not say anything to me. We'll have anything to say. And every day you're in that state. The church may say nothing, but I tell you what, the world is talking about you. And the world is speaking negatively of the Lord because of what you did. Well, can't, can't the Lord forgive me for a single act? Yes. But he ain't going to forgive you for a single act if you do that same single act the next day and the next day and the next day. And then your lifestyle becomes that single act. So no longer, it's no longer a single act. It, you have determined that this is the way you're going to be. So that means there's no true repentance. And if you've been out there, if you've done it long enough, you've been out there long enough, long enough, long enough, long enough, long enough, long enough, long enough. Then you won't crucify Christ anymore because after a while everybody will forget that you were ever saved in the first place. But in the initial fall, damage is done. Damage is done. Not just to your family's name. Not just to your local church. But to Jesus Christ himself. And I'll be honest with you. I don't want to do that to Jesus. Jesus will never be crucified again. Jesus gets crucified often. He's never physically going back to that cross. But the writer 
shows us how. How it's done. We want you to walk in the things that accompany salvation. You dating, saved couples, engaged. We expect, we have the, we, we, it is reasonable for us to expect for you to save sex for marriage. That ain't, that ain't that ain't being judgmental. That ain't being hard. You named the name of Christ. You said you had the Holy Ghost. It's reasonable. That's reasonable. You Christian young man, young preacher, dating this girl, y'all get married. It's reasonable for us to expect a uh, certain level. Preach wouldn't. It's reasonable to expect that if a family is saved and they get a car, they get a house, they make bills. It's reasonable to expect for them to pay their bills on time. Because you sat there and spoke in tongues when you were getting the car. How come my shy? He's coming on a Honda. Ho, bo, bo, bo. Show, 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 show. And now, after all of that, after all of that, then you go and won't pay. The man don't just talk about you. He talks about your church. He talks about your God. He talks against your religion. You have made a negative impression. You college students, you're in a school. You're in the school to learn. You're not in the school to be a thug. You're not in the school to be a drug dealer. You're not in the school to not go to class. I'm, I'm, I don't go to class. I do what I want. See, you're dumb. See, you, they're going to they kick you out and you end up being a loser. You're on your way to nowhere land. Amen. Amen. That's not why. That's not why you're placed there. I'm through. But I want to walk in those things that accompany salvation. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. We want the fruit of salvation evident in our lives. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I want, I want the fruit of everything. Lord, Lord I'm a, I am a, a male. I'm an American male. I'm an African American male. I'm an American male. Lord, let the things that, are, that, that people reasonably expect from a grown man to be evident in my life. May I not act like a child as a grown man. Lord Jesus, oh God, every father, you ought to pray this prayer. Every husband, every mother, every saint, no matter what you are today, you ought to ask God, Lord, let the, those, those reasonable expectations that accompany a person who claims to be who and what I am, let those things be evident, Lord. Oh God. Oh, God, starting with my Christianity, starting with my walk with you, let the fruit follow. Let the evidence show forth. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let chastity, let the evidence of chastity, whether it's in, in person or online or on Facebook or on posts, let, let their posts be holy. That's a good prayer right there. Let, let what they post be sanctified. It's reasonable to expect that a saved young lady's online posts and what they put online would be sanctified. You want to be sanctified in the church and look like a, a little hoochie online. It is reasonable for us to expect you to look like a saint online because you said you were a saint. Oh my God. Bless right now. Bless right now. Bless right now. In the name of Jesus. Let it follow us, Lord. Let it follow us. In Jesus' name. Amen. While you're standing, there may be somebody here today who wants to be saved. I want to know Jesus. This is good. This is good. This is a good sermon to get saved in. Tight, but it's right. Hard, but it's fair. It's the kind of preaching that we used to hear all the time. Yeah, now everything goes. 
we were in trouble the first time somebody put on their bumper sticker on their car. Christians, not perfect, just forgiven. People begin to read, read that and say, you know what? We ain't perfect, and that ain't going to be our goal. And we're just going to be forgiven and begin to live raggedy life. Young man, the Lord's calling you to a higher level. Serve the Lord. Would that be somebody that says, preacher, I want to be saved? We'll pray for you, and the Lord will save you from your sins. Glory to God. God bless you today. Whew, glory.